Right, so uh, without further ado, uh, I, I would like to invite John to give us a presentation. Looking forward to it. Um, hopefully there will be some time for questions at the end. Um, thank you very much. Very welcome. John. Thanks very much, Paul. Uh, very pleased to be here and there and wherever. Um, um, and as this is probably a sort of, uh, well, I've talked at Sark before. Usually when I give a talk in a new place, I always call to mind uh, the wise words of Hank Wangford, uh, um, a great uh, English uh, uh, country music player and gynecologist. And he um, uh, always, when he played in a new, a new gig in a new place, he would always say, there are no strangers here, only friends I do not yet recognize. And so I will say that today. Um, I also have to tell you by way of introduction that um, this talk has given me some trouble. I uh, haven't been quite sure about what to say, how to pitch it, whether it to be a, a work of rigorous scholarship or a much more impressionistic piece, uh, whether, to whether to cover a lot of my sort of biography, whether to cover just the specific specifics of the last um, so many months working uh, with people at Sark. Um, and Elvis came to me in a dream last night and and he stood at the bottom of my bed and he said, John, and I said, yeah. And he said, just say it like it is. And then he left. So I will. I will say it like it is. I'll tell you uh, uh, what I've been doing over the last six months and also over the last nearly 63 years. OK, so I will share screen and. Uh, uh, do, 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 do. OK, so I have a presentation to give. Um, there will be no repeat, no audio, either high fidelity or low fidelity or anything today that can count as music type audio. There'll just be the dulcet tones of me speaking. And uh, if you want to hear stuff, you come tomorrow. You come tomorrow, this time tomorrow, to uh, uh, listen to this event, Archive X. And, uh, and this is a, a, a kind of concept for an event I've been working on for a while. And uh, it will involve uh, a, a simultaneous presentation of what I'm calling an essay film, uh, Archive X Underperformance. And also uh, there will be an improvisation, in fact, the debut public improvisation by a new trio, the three body problem. If you know your Newton, you'll know what that means, uh, uh, featuring Adam, Paul and myself. And this will be uh, in parallel with uh, the showing of the film. And, uh, uh, and it's really the development of this piece, the thinking behind it, uh, some of the uh, uh, um, some of the technical details, but I won't go deeply into that today. Uh, uh, that is really going to be the subject of the talk. But as I say, this does link to quite uh, long term personal biographical obsessions and uh, uh, which I will indulge myself in letting you know a bit about. OK, a little quote I'm going to start with uh, from Raymond Quinno, uh, a writer I'm very fond of, who's writing, who's talking about Olympians. These are members of the Ulipo, uh, the Ouvoir pour Literature Potentielle, the Workshop for Potential Literature, a group of largely French but international uh, uh, writers who in investigating the possibility of the use of constraints to engender potential literature, engender literary productivity that might find its way into literary work. And um, and Quino and Francois Lalione, the founders of this movement, were uh, particularly interested in whether mathematical ideas could be applied to the production of potential literature. And uh, this quote from Quino, I think, is quite fascinating. He characterized the Olympians as rats who build the labyrinth from which they will try to escape. And uh, I've always very much liked this characterization of, well, um, whatever, uh, from, uh, you know, um, reconstructing a flat pack piece of furniture uh, to scholarly work, uh, to composition, to creative work of all sorts. The idea that one's a, a lowly rat scrabbling around in the materials that you are presented with, but trying to build something as grand as a labyrinth 
but something which will trap us, of course, but also something which we will escape from. And so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today, I suppose, is how I have built a, a labyrinth of sorts uh, and how I plan to escape. Although I won't say much about that because the guards might be listening. Um, so the outline of the talk, uh, I'll say a little bit about how I've responded to pandemic conditions. Uh, I'll say a little bit about how in some ways my work has taken uh, an archival turn. I'll talk about a series of projects which I'm, I've been engaged with over the few years and reflecting on them under the banner of many makings. Um, I'll introduce the idea of the film essay, the essay, or the idea of essaying uh, as a, a way perhaps of thinking about one's uh, creative work. And I'll say something about the making of Archive X Underperformance, the film essay I've made for tomorrow. And I'll say something about the kinds of things I've been doing uh, in preparation for work with the three body problem, Archive X Overperformance. And at the end, I will allude to how one might escape from all of this. Now, well, this is me, um, um, uh, handsome, mm. uh, with my machineries uh, at a, a, a music festival uh, in 2019, September 2019, Yarmonics in Great Yarmouth in, uh, in Norfolk. And um, and it kind of shows me doing, I suppose, what I have been loving the best, um, gigging. And uh, I'm a fairly, for a full-time academic, fairly profuse gigger. I average more than one a month. I have had a year while working at Newcastle where I had 45 gigs in a year. Um, and it's always been extremely important to me to have a regular supply of live performance. And that kind of regular accountability for your work of bringing out new work and presenting things at a certain granularity and with a certain frequency before the public. That's always been a very key motivational driver for me. And of course, that has disappeared. Um, I, in the plague year, I've had to rethink. And I've actually generally been rather discontent with the idea of streaming performances from home. And I've been slow to take that up, slow to do that. A lot of people just did that immediately day one. And some people did sort of good work, some people less good work. I'm not sure. It's not something that I felt attracted to because it didn't quite have the motivational structure that I was used to with face to face gigs. So I became more reclusive. I engaged in study. Uh, under plague conditions, under lockdown, I don't live with somebody who uh, is abusive. I don't live under conditions of poverty. Um, I've quite liked my own company being an only child. Um, I don't have a lot of the sufferings. I have a, I have a well-paid day job. I realize that there's an immense privilege behind what I'm saying. Uh, and this privilege expressed itself in I think uh, two or three turns, I did a lot more dedicated study than I would normally do, like reading books. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a picture of Julian of Norwich. I read a lot of books written by hermits or uh, in uh, Julian's case, anchorites, people who lived under conditions of isolation. Uh, Julian of Norwich, I found particularly interesting. The, challenges she places for God. Uh, uh, Oi, God, show me what I should be doing. Oi, God, if, you, if you're really there, make me sick. Um, and also the optimism that she has, the, the willingness to stand up to power and the optimism she has in her kind of encapsulated in her phrase, all will be well. I read Giorgio Gamben on uh, Franciscanism. Uh, the, uh, and again, the ideas of seclusion, of developing a form of life in a concentrated way, uh, uh, which, which he documents, and also the troubles that that raises when you have to deal with the Vatican, when you have to deal with local legislature and so on. 
And that gave me some interesting thoughts. I read Karen Barad. Now, I've cited Karen Barad for many years. Uh, and I actually now have read uh, uh, Meeting the Universe Halfway. Uh, and uh, again, her conceptions of entanglement, her conceptions of intra-action, her ideas of how ontologies, if you will, uh, emerge out of complex processes, um, uh, much more uh, complex and nuanced than are typically relate, can be typically captured in our standard notions of inter-action, I found very useful. I read Matt Colquhoun's book, uh, Egress, uh, uh, on Mark Fisher. Uh, and if people are interested in the work of Mark Fisher, I would recommend Colquhoun's book. Colquhoun particularly picks out ideas of egress or escape and uh, the possibility that political conditions, social conditions can be escaped from somehow and entering into uh, thinking about what forms egress might take. And are there forms beyond, say, death, dementia, um, are there forms beyond Taoism? Um, are there forms perhaps involving defunding, decolonization, direct democracy, or to use Mark Fisher's term, acid communism? Various possible formulations of escape uh, uh, are entertained uh, in some of this literature following on from Fisher. And this uh, seemed, uh, this was useful to me. Well, Paul and I did do some work together, did do some collaborative work. Uh, we have a series of things, and this is a, a screenshot of uh, Paul's webpage where you can find out more information about it. Things uh, that uh, Paul christened tragic experiments. Um, we engaged with uh, remote communications technology and really tried to break them. Uh, and we made various sort of accounts after the, effect, after the fact, taking multiple recordings from different perspectives and then offered our own different accounts out of that multiplicity of what went on. So again, this was an, a, an extended series of experiments Paul and I engaged in where we were not wanting to mend the wounds uh, using Zoom or other technologies mend the disjunctures but explore the disjunctures uh, and perhaps provide some strategies for escape from them so under conditions of confinement i engaged in quite a lot of personal reflection as i'm sure many of us did but this is where i spent a lot i've been spending a large amount of my time since march and this is uh, my studio. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's a mess. It's a complete mess. But before, you know, the Marie Kondo fans of you in the audience here, give me a good, a hard time. I mean, you should see Francis Bacon's studio in Dublin. I mean, if you want a mess, I aspire to his condition, but there's just so much stuff here. It's, I'm not sure exactly how it's all ordered, except layered by recency of touch. Um, and there's a, a massive heterogeneity of things here. Um, and the more I spent time here, the more I grew to love it and the more I grew to love studio work. And where studio work meant dealing with uh, the daily confrontation of this messy heterogeneity and this sort of made me think and i'm also going to credit uh jade malabone who might be with us today as well for having a considerable influence on this who's doing a phd with me at newcastle taking an archival turn upon one's own personal productions so treating this as an archive as something which one can uh, make some kind of turn on a personal archive and make some kind of sense of that. And of course, classic to um, archival turns in the art world is um, Hal Foster's An Archival Inf Impulse, where 
uh, dating from 2004, where he has he discusses a number of artists and he makes a number of analyses under he gives three different formulas in the formulations in the in the paper of archive as archive as capitalist garbage bucket archive as failed futuristic vision archive as partially buried woodshed um, and underneath these headings and I, I guess you can see for example as uh, under archive as failed futuristic vision he has an extensive discussion of Tacitus of Dean um, uh, and uh, the uh, and under archive as partially buried woodshed he has a discussion of Robert Smithson's work where uh, uh, a woodshed associated with uh, a horrendous murder uh, was uh, relocated and reconstructed and reburied in an art space again to kind of bring artifacts of historical documentary significance into uh, art spaces. So there's, he discusses various things there, but there's a, there's a very interesting final set of remarks he makes in this paper where he anticipates personal archiving, where people might make an archival turn on their own personal productions. And also he emphasizes the drive that many people involved in archival art or taking an archival turn on art have to connect what cannot be connected, uh, to probe a misplaced past, to collate its different signs, to ascertain what might survive or be useful for the present. Uh, assuming an anomic fragmentation, but to propose new orders for affect, however partial and provision, and to this end, even as it registers the difficulties and at times the absurdity of so doing. And, um, and so it seemed to me that this is what I wanted. I wanted to take a turn on my sort of own work, which had this kind of reassurance and recognized the will to connect what cannot be connected and to create new effective provisional or affective orders, uh, even though this was difficult and perhaps absurd. Now, just give, I gave a name check to Jade Malibu, and here's some of some of her work where she has recast some of her personal journal uh, in various forms of abstract translation, and that's a feature of Jade's work. She repeatedly retranslates uh, uh, ar archival material with varying degrees of uh, abstraction, redaction, and reworking. And multiplication. Uh, this is an example from Jacek Slamiski, again, uh, whose concept of para archives and his PhD thesis from Malmo and other writings of his I'd commend to you. This is an example where uh, of an interface to a work where he um, makes made a one minute uh, sound recording every day, uh, a piece called uh, Minuting. So much on reflection of my work has been based on a principle of divergence, a principle of um, making lots of stuff and doing stuff, making stuff with a light heart, sometimes in a bursty fashion in quick order, uh, sometimes things which are so close to materials and superficial, uh, sometimes things which are more hard worked through. Um, varying in their academic or scholarly relevance, uh, varying in their seriousness or flippancy. But the important point is that there's been many and many divergent things. And I revisited the last few years of presentations I've, I've given. And uh, as you see, I have an in, endearing love of Gil Sans Bold. Uh, and these are slides taken from over the years of just many of the things I've made. And some of them, uh, you know, have had a bit of currency. Um, for example, the Victorian synthesizer, the idea of using hacking loudspeakers and batteries to create a very primitive synthesizer uh, has been um, uh, worked on by a number of people as a kind of uh, handmade music hacker uh introductory piece nick collins writes about it in his various volumes of uh 
of work. Um, I've done, I've, uh, I've, again, on the top row there, I have a couple of images from something I call, oh my God, which in, just involves putting power across random electronic components. Um, but then there's, there's, so a lot of those projects are kind of, uh, seem semi-conceptual, but in fact, actually are very much grounded in exploring the materials, the materiality of electromagnetism, the materiality of raw circuitry. Um, and, and then there's other more extended projects like uh, uh, a project with Tom Schofield, which we've actually still not yet published, actually, which is rather remiss of us, called Turing Tape Music, where we physically constructed a uh, Turing machine uh, rather than leave it as a thought experiment in mathematics and uh, got it to uh, uh, execute rule systems as a real electromechanical advice device and used its various, sonified its various states and visualized its various states in live performance. Uh, a lot of different kinds of work. Um, and, uh, and also image work, uh, image work uh, and work working cross-modally, uh, intermedia work. Um, I, there's some sort of a series of, uh, again, pictures from presentations I've given over the years. Uh, an interest in scavenging materials and uh, resonant or otherwise. Uh, an interest in uh, um, some various images from live performance, but also uh, possibilities of having unusual performance environments, unusual performance ecologies. There's a couple of dark images there of a floor-based performance I did with Tim Shaw and Rob Blasey uh, um, just over a year ago. So lots of stuff, lots of stuff, lots of different kinds of stuff. And this kind of principle of multiplicity, divergence, uh, short, sharp bursts of making and trying to make some sense of it is also featured in some of my published research work. So this is a this is a uh, refers to a project that uh, Tim, who is with us today, and myself were involved with working with Fact in Liverpool in 2016. And again, I'm just going to breeze over this quickly in this sort of like light box slideshow view. Um, we made lots of stuff. We had a project which was uh, loosely briefed around looking at alternative ways for characterizing, multiple alternative ways for characterizing the soundscape of Liverpool, the urban soundscape of Liverpool. And uh, we made lots of different kinds of pieces, working uh, collaboratively with members of the public in a series of sort of public making workshops uh, and bringing, gathering a whole series of pieces of work together into a performance where um, uh, Tim and I and uh, uh, shared the bill with Philip Jack in a 20 loudspeaker uh, icosahedral environment, which was constructed in Gallery One, in, in fact. Um, so again, a multiplicity of things in response to a brief and then uh, gathered together. Um, Working with people at De Montfort University, people working around uh, John Richards. Uh, again, Tim and I worked uh, on this, uh, 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 bringing people from Newcastle and Leicester together. And this, this paper you can find uh, in the proceedings of the NIME conference in 2018. Again, a philosophy of making many things to a brief, the brief of one knob to rule them all, a kind of Again, a kind of facetious provocation to make lots of things. And uh, again, I just give you a spread of the different kinds of things different artists made, uh, different ways of hacking and adjusting potentiometers, different ways of using a single knob to control multiple sound uh, sources in a complex diffusion project, ways of using um, a tuner on a radio, uh, and the sound coming out of the radio reanalyzed to provide control streams for a modular synthesizer. But again, there being just one knob, the tuner knob, an assemblage uh, uh, made out of a turntable and um, uh, a no input mixer desk, lots of different kinds of things. But then again, brought together in a promenade 
performance uh, uh, at the end, uh, which was actually structured on quite interesting principles, which I uh, can say a little bit more about uh, later on if anyone's interested. But again, bringing things together, divergent, multilateral making in response to a provocation brought back together again. Uh, another paper from um, the Neem Nime series of conferences with Owen Green, uh, paper of performance we called uh, All the Noises, uh, where we made a large number of, 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 of things to challenge concepts in machine listening research, con to challenge ideas of the automated analysis of musical production. And again, this was a project worked out just between me and me and uh, Owen and and we circulated proposals in advance and I think that we circulated 48 things that we might make this is a, a list of mine uh, I'm not going to go over them uh, and this is a list of uh, Owens and in the end we made a few of them over the course of uh, four intensive days two, two in Newcastle two in Huddersfield uh, different kinds of, uh, uh, of things which in some ways are ironic challenges on ideas of machine listening, musical cognition as uh, practiced by various uh, researchers, um, but also um, are uh, uh, interesting processes for putting live sound through. And we, again, we assembled this multiplicity of things in a single uh, uh performance durational performance lecture environment in the in the spiral environment in Huddersfield and and again all of our makes had a presence in one of the loudspeakers one or more of the loudspeakers and the whole affair was listened to by a dummy head uh whom we named Stooky Helen um uh who listened to uh the performance and then passed what she was listening to into multiple parallel algorithms back out into uh, the environment and and uh, 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 Owen and I uh, intervened in the process in various ways. Now this is what I want to bring out from this uh, this line of work. It's a line of work which has been based upon divergent proposal uh, making divergent proposals multilateral making in response to some kind of brief or provocation. And it's something that brings that multiplicity back into various kinds of performative events. And these performative events sometimes have the character of a gig, sometimes a, a whole concert program, sometimes uh, a, com a performative installation, sometimes a lecture performance. But they're all based on some kind of assemblage principle some kind of principle where we want to have our multiplicity of investigation still done justice to. Um, we often think of these as ecologies, ecologies of listening, ecologies of performance and action. And it's, I think, interesting, and I've been beginning to think, and I've explored this kind of concept as well with Rolf Hughes, uh, who some of you might know. I characterize, I've been trying to think about hold alls uh, what could count as a hold or what could gather things together what kind of metaphors do we want to pursue for dealing with multiplicity without losing the detail uh, to excess um, how can we can we sort of have more ordinary an ordinary language proliferation of ideas rather than just stay stuck with the Gilles Deleuzean assemblage or something like that. So hold alls, textiles, soup. Now, typically when I sort of do these things that I've just mentioned, which have their outcome as academic research papers, there is a process of reflection and annotation so that uh, research issues of various sorts are spoken to. And this concept of annotation, I just want to give a little few words to, especially as Bill is in the audience. Now, Bill and I did some pieces in 2012. And in some ways, we were intervening in a very particular niche in the academic world, uh, discussions and debates surrounding um, uh, the viability of a style of research that Bill and I both practice in some form called research through design. 
And uh, that kind of line of thought was, in, was getting some sustained criticism from researchers from a, a certain kind of, shall I say, scientific background with a certain value, a certain sort of, with engineering methods and certain kinds of, uh, of experimental methods having the highest value. And we, in our different ways, worked out uh, a, a, an alternative way in which a portfolio of creative work might be annotated to bring out similarities and differences, but in such a way that could speak to research issues, we felt just as surely and possibly more informatively than, say, a standard user test of a design. And I've made various attempts over the years to annotate what the kinds of things I've just said to you. And here's again a bunch, a slideshow of uh, a light box of uh, various things I've I've done in talks over the years. And um, and a lot of what I'm saying should probably be sort of begin to emerge to be obvious to you from what I, from what I've been saying in my style of, of presenting these uh, presenting these 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 pieces of work. So I won't go over this in detail. But this is some. This is just an example. For example, this is the, from the one knob to rule it rule them all paper. Um, the different kinds of makes were sort of annotated in terms of raw data, raw sound, objects, things, and assemblages, restrictions and openness, playable perversity, shifting agency. Um, Owen and I analyze things as well in terms of creating noise, negating noise control, opaque practice, letting the environment in, ambiguities of sincerity and insincerity. And this idea of annotation uh, and thinking that annotation could actually be used productively, creatively in a work uh, also got a little bit of a fillip from me from uh, 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 Dieter Schnabel, uh, and this might sound a very surprising connection that I'm making. Um, it's Dieter Schnabel's Symphony X, which uh, he uh, wrote or and assembled towards the end of his life, is a kind of fascinating, open-ended, provisional, inclusive, to be revised, ongoing work. And this is the uh, sleeve notes from the uh, CD release, and he has into in it a very interesting short essay on the symphony. And you can imagine a lot of the uh, Darmstadt crew were utterly horrified when Schnabel uh, said that he was writing a symphony. But there's a very interesting uh, essay here that he writes in the in in the notes to the CD, characterizing different annotations, if you will, of the portfolio of the corpus of symphonies, uh, the symphony as a design or project, the symphony as a work unfinished. I really like this point, making unfinishedness, uh, as it were, almost a constitutive feature of the, or the potential for unfinishedness as a constitutive feature of the symphony. It's not accidental that symphonies are unfinished. It's actually a feature of symphonies that they are often unfinished. The symphony is utopia, the symphony is a large form, the symphony is an idea realized in sound, the symphony is a drama of mental life, the symphony is a mystery. And, and, and Schnabel wanted to, to set as his target attending to all of these in some way and making reactions to all of these in some way in his symphony X. X indicating that it had a variable uh, undisclosed identity. Okay, uh, hold alls, yeah. So something that could give shape and belonging, but maybe not do a lot else, uh, give a place, so a hold all. But there's a bunch. The labyrinth might be a hold all. Um, soup might be a hold all. Uh, textiles, the book of hours, an almanac, a box um or the essay and again i want to kind of thank uh uh um someone working on a phd with me jez Corum, for really uh introducing me to uh the essay form and in particular the essay film and i have a quote here from this is actually from michelle de montagne uh that uh from 
um, his essays volumes, which he assembled between 1570 and 1592. The essay is less a, 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 a collection of discrete articles than and actually on full screen, I can't read the size side of this quote probably says than an overlapping, seemingly infinite series of trials, targets, exercises, and it probably says and meditations. So the idea of something being provisional, proliferating, seemingly infinite, something being put to the trial, something having maybe a target, uh, something having a meditative quality. Uh, this is what uh, uh, de Montaigne identifies with the essay. And thinking that one might bring the essay form to some of my problems, uh, to some of the questions of multiplicity, annotation, organization, and holding all, thinking of the essay as a hold all, and in particular, maybe the essay film. And uh, here I have a, a poster from Chris Marker's uh, Sans Soleil, uh, which is a, um, um, an essay film I would recommend to you from 1983. And it shows various stills from the movie. And you can see that there is a great variety of visual material here. Uh, much, but not all of it, is documentary in a some sense in origin. Uh, but a considerable variety and there's a narration over the film as uh, as well and a very interestingly uh, designed soundtrack and also i want to draw attention actually to the image right in the middle at the bottom and this is attributed by marker to a japanese video artist called hayao uh, yamanenko uh, and is uh, according to uh, um, marker the product of Yamanenko's uh, uh, video synthesis system, which he calls the zone, uh, the zone following actually Andrei Tarkovsky's idea, well, the Strugatsky brothers' idea from the movie Stalker, uh, a place with an alternative physics, a place with where different kinds of relationships can come into existence, where connections can be made between the non-connectable, to refer back to Foster. And uh, uh, yeah, it's questionable whether anyone uh, called Hayao Yamanenko's ever existed. Uh, and uh, the images shown within Sans Soleil actually show an EMS Spectron uh, video synthesizer, for those of you who follow this sort of thing, uh, being manipulated by marker, but processing images and creating a kind of psychedelic world uh, where uh, new connections can be made between color and form. So a lot of this kind of thinking gets sort of put together in Archive X. The title, of course, has some relationship to uh, the influence from Schnabel. And this, in one version of it, or an outing, to, you will, it could experience tomorrow, if you will, and I hope you will able to. As I say, it's, I've said it's simultaneously, there's an underperformance and an overperformance. And the underperformance is an essay film I've made. Uh, and the overperformance uh, is an improvisation by Adam Paul and myself. And I've included uh, a bunch of stills on this uh, uh, from uh, the movie I've made. And the movie I've made it goes over a 10 year archive of images uh, and there's a long kind of autoethnography I could give you about the making of this, uh, which I might sort of document sometime. Um, but ultimately, I've come to have a number of um, quite long takes and occasional stills uh, and they're of a vastly varied character, but their character is organized in terms of six sections. Now, these sections are not absolutely unambiguously marked in the movie. They're, they're listed at the beginning and not referred back to at the end. And the six sections are in a way, in some cases, slightly more poetic renderings of the kinds of annotations that I have reflecting upon my work. Transduction, 
Ask not what is in the machine, but what the machine is in. Ruined temple, soup, love hours, and escape mechanism. I'll say a little bit, I think some of these will ex explain themselves on the basis of what I've been saying already, but love hours I will give some further explanation to. On, on looking back at the kinds of things that I seem to video record over the years, I seem to love toys and naivety and secondhand shops. And, um, uh, and a few years ago, I went to a, a, a very large retrospective exhibition of uh, Mike Kelly's uh, at uh, the Stedelijk in Amsterdam. And one of Kelly's famous pieces is, is, a, is, a, is a whole uh, assemblage, uh, a vertical assemblage stuck to uh, um, a surface to be affixed to the wall, a piece called More Love Hours Than Can Ever Be Repaid. And it's a selection of cuddly toys, um, which uh, are just which he gathered from secondhand shops. So toys abandoned uh, by children growing up or repurposed by their unpleasant parents or whatever. More love hours than can ever be repaid. Actually, whenever I talk to people about this, this work, I have a tear in my eye. And Kelly really sort of hit me hard with that title. And with also with the idea of there being something um, uh, very powerful about abandoned, mass-produced artifacts of a sentimental kind. Okay, so this is uh, this is uh, for your pleasure tomorrow. Now, alongside the movie, I've been working on um, some uh, new ideas for working. Well, new to me, ideas of working with sound. Particularly, and this emerged out of some improvisation sessions uh, Paul uh, and uh, Adam and myself had uh, before um, uh, lockdown hit us. And it emerged that we were having a shared interest in materials, resonances, feedback. And this set for me a little kind of developmental agenda for working uh, uh, through the visiting position. And of course, I have history. Uh, I, I've worked on rainforest, uh, David Tudor's rainforest a number of times. Um, and uh, uh, I was involved with uh, uh, an, uh, uh, the installation version of, a rain, of Tudor's rainforest in 2009 uh, that a number of us did in Peckham in London. This is a piece which has uh, or a series of pieces associated with Tudor, which involves resonating physical objects and transducing the resonances of physical objects, often in complex feedback networks. Um, Robert Millet and I, when the Rombert Dance Company revised Rainforest uh, One, uh, Robert Millet and I uh, toured uh, as the musicians uh, um, working on it. Um, so, uh, Tudor and Tudor's concerns strongly influential on me. Also strongly influential on me is a work by Nick Collins, Pea Soup, uh, which is a, a very interesting feedback piece. I know this has been uh, performed at least once at Sark because I was there, um, uh, where a microphone passes into uh, a phase delay where the delay time is set by how loud the signal is coming through the microphone and then passes out in through an amplifier into a loudspeaker and set in the right to the right level of criticality, this produces continually changing uh, feedback textures. Um, Elian Radig's work is uh, also a strong source for me. This uh, album of feedback works is a completely meticulous uh, uh, mixing of various recordings of feedback, studio feedback she made in the period in the late 60s, early 70s, with very meticulous placing of microphones and interventions, I think, from an ARP uh, synthesizer. Very, very painstaking work. Uh, and also in, in, in interview, Radig says some quite fascinating things, I think, about, about the interest she had in feedback and interest, actually, one of the guiding features of her music generally is, a, is, is how she is always interested in music when it modulates. 
the modulation, say, between keys in classical music, those moments of modulation. And she characterizes her work often as in perpetual modulation. And again, she saw feedback as a way of realizing this. This is a, a diagram, a functional diagram for Agostino de Scipio's um, uh, background noise study and showing a, a long loop, a 20 second long loop from which various other processes can, uh, um, uh, can take uh, things, a high pass filter, resampling, granular uh, processing as well. So I decided to make a, a kind of feedback environment, um, um, a feedback environment to end all of the feedback environments that I'd made before. So from Collins, Radig and De Scipio, the concern for room resonance and also the concern for the adaptation of how feedback takes place. Remember, Collins has this voltage control of the phaser driven by ampl amplitude. De Scipio has analyses informing how the feedback takes place. And then there's Radig's painstaking manipulation of microphone and loudspeaker positioning, something which would uh, have that manipulability or adaptation. From De Scipio and Tudor, I wanted to take the idea that there were multiple feedback routes. From Tudor, an openness to possibility of transduction across materials. And again, from Radig, taking modulation, an interest in continual modulation, and also uh, thinking about ways in which one could engender different forms of listening, uh, which were specifically uh, indigenous to feedback. And I wanted to take things forward a little bit to connect with some of my concerns, to present a feedback ecology as a hold all, as sort of my audio take in some ways, my sonic take on Yamanenko's zone. But I wanted to support also what I call hot and cold gesture. So meticulous, slow change, but also being able to do some things with a, to occupy a greater dynamic range and a microstructure within the dynamic range. I wanted to make something with little setup or optimization. Um, uh, so, so it could basically just go. Um, again, uh, adapting one of Karen Barad's ideas of intra action, I wanted the ways in which one engaged with this uh, to, in some ways, work themselves out from within. Um, so there's uh, no or very little uh, mapping that's here programmed in advance. A lot of what's in the system that you'll hear me working with tomorrow involves self-programmed performable mappings. The mappings program themselves. And it's also a system which is open to the grit coming from others and one which perhaps supports the facetious idea that my archival materials are actually the products of very long delay lines. So it looks like this in PD. That's what my PD tends to look like. It looks like this as a hand-drawn uh, diagram from this morning, which actually contains an obvious error, which I'm sure you'll notice immediately. But there's a whole battery of different kinds of effects. And this is something, again, that suits my sort of multiplying divergent methods that I can grow. Uh, these are things which take uh, uh, room sound or a feedback loop from themselves as their source. Uh, extra grit can be put in, synthesizers, voice, both locally in my studio. Um, a zither and a snare drum are all wired for action already, uh, but also the workings of others. Archival um, recordings will also have a role. And uh, either side of the processing, the process, I've designed saturation and limiting techniques very, very carefully so that things do support this kind of hot and cold gestural interaction. Uh, they're always on the point of exploding, but well, do they, they, they have a certain sort of, not exactly discipline, they have a certain thing that allows a conjoint ill discipline, uh, which uh, certain kinds of uh, maxing out digital full scale might not. Okay, so 
you will, if you wish, hear all of this and see all of this in Archive X uh, uh, tomorrow. So I'm going to kind of finish with uh, uh, requoting Quono. Uh, Rats who build a labyrinth from which they try to escape. Well, I've given you an account of some of my labyrinths. And I won't say I've actually formulated uh, an escape plan. Uh, I still have the short list of death, dementia, Taoism, defunding, decolonization, direct democracy and acid communism. Uh, but maybe we can do uh, something when the guards aren't noticing tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. So if we could uh, go out, yep, yeah, back to that mode, I will remove the pen. So just a reminder that we are recording at the moment. So if you don't want your image to be captured, you can keep your, um, your video stopped. Um, but otherwise, feel free to turn your video on um, so we can see your lovely faces. Uh, so we have a short amount of time here for, for some questions. And you can either pose questions by uh, raising your hand and I will call on you, or you can type questions into the chat. Um, so are there any questions for John? So in, in, a, in a traditional chair role, I will start by breaking the spell of, of asking the initial question. And, uh, you know, actually this one was, you know, planned beforehand in my head uh, when I noticed a certain cuddly toy, but actually uh, in the background of John's um, Melu. Uh, so John, the, the blue bear, uh, um, it's, it's given extra meaning um, by the point, part of your presentation about the abandoned toys and the exhibition you saw, I believe, in Amsterdam. But could you tell us um, why the bear is accompanying you today? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, oh, just, just as a little point also. Do people realize when they go to secondhand shops, they are considering purchasing the relics of the dead? Do people consider this? I mean, the last, the vast amount of, of material in secondhand shops are, you know, cleared out homes, are things from people who have died that nobody wants to take on. And there's, there's something sort of, I think, you know, extremely strong, uh, as, as, as BC says, everyday media archaeology. There's something extremely strong about, uh, about these sorts of, uh, of these artifacts, uh, ornaments, toys, once you give that kind of realization to them. And um, uh, this, uh, the blue bear, uh, Unity is uh, the bear's name. Uh, Unity is a Thai beanie baby. Uh, in bear form. Uh, and I bought Unity in the year 2000 when I was working in um, uh, uh, KTH in Stockholm in Sweden. And I was working there, I worked there for over about 10 years, and uh, uh, we had a series of EU funded projects, uh, quite big ones. Uh, and that was really a very common feature of how I did my work. And uh, Unity is a, an EU bear. And uh, He's here to help out, uh, to witness uh, witness things. And of course, it's a stressful day for him, um, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, it may be that Boris Johnson won't choke on a fishbone tonight uh, in his meal with uh, Ursula van Leyen. We'll have to see. So th there's quite a lot of stuff to chew on in that presentation, but are there any questions to people or comments or observations? We have quite an interesting collection of people here. I'd love to hear um, some thoughts and reflections. In the meantime, while you are thinking, I've provided a link to the live stream for the concert tomorrow in the chat. You're welcome to click on that and you can have that ready to go. Uh, the concert will be from uh, one o'clock uh, to roughly two o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Um, that is Greenwich Mead time, one o'clock. So, I had a question. Great, uh, go for it. Hi. Um, so, in one of in one of the performances you were talking about, you said that there was 
uh, those kind of moments of just allowing the sound to kind of reverb as well as kind of be put through. I think it was the one about the head. It was like the head was listening to something and then it was kind of coming back through. Oh, yeah, again. yeah, yeah. Um, and in that you, you used a, a term that kind of made me consider another kind of train of thought, which I wonder if you identify with and if you do uh, what you might have to say on it, which is you said there were moments of intervention. There are moments you intervened, um, which kind of suggests moments of letting things play the way that they are and then moments where you kind of come in. And I wondered, because you know as well as I do how much I've looked at kind of artist as curator, artist as archivist, mm -hmm. how much yeah. you might identify with this idea of artist as intervention. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that, that is all. I mean, I think, uh, I think it's very interesting to try and de devise ecologies um if you will uh which uh support multiple footings um by footings i'm sort of making an allusion to irving goffman's um kind of term the ways in which we can relate to ongoing action uh so we can be a part of you know a full participant in ongoing action we can be a recipient of it we can be an overseer of it we can be an interloper we can uh there are many different ways in which one can relate to ongoing action and and and, and in goffman's case he's particularly interested in conversational interaction and institutional talk there's many different ways in which we can relate so and these these are these are you know goffman collectively talks as footings using a sort of um, theatrical metaphor uh so there's different and and i i think it's i think it's nice to try and generate environments where which allow multiple footings so yeah you can come in and uh re and configure things as uh, uh as instruments to your playing but there are other moments where things can just run autonomously um and there are other moments where maybe those uh autonomous things can sort of uh, influence each other and um and and having some kind of way of uh of of of, of holding that all together um the room and its resonances uh is is i think a very interesting way of doing it um and this is in some ways means that if we if you do want to talk about agency agency try and make the sh the potential shifting of agency or the potential construction and reconstruction of agency, the kinds of things Karen Barad refers to under intra-action. Try and make that, uh, if not a subject matter of a work, then at least something which uh, can be explored in real time in the work. Uh, and to me, that has that way of thinking of things also has a natural affinity with the, the kinds of ways I like to think about musical improvisation as well. Um, uh, ones where um agencies shift um uh ones where uh um you know different doctrines are in play uh but none are uh, uh um uh, tyrannical great so we gonna we're gonna have to wrap up soon there is one question in the chat that i just spotted uh which maybe john you can speak to briefly um bc asks Will the film have a live element or is it all prepared media? Yeah. Um, oh, ah, I see. I accidentally replied to this, but only to Bill Gaver uh, because he wrote to me something privately before. Um, uh, uh, so, yes, uh, absolutely. We are playing live uh, tomorrow. Uh, the three body problem are playing live. And um, uh, so um that will absolutely be happening live um adam in berlin paul in belfast me on north tyneside yes and we will be streamed out all together from the sonic arts research center thanks very much to craig um for helping bring that together um any other final thoughts or questions for john um if not, please just maybe. Oh, Richard. Richard. Hello. Go ahead. You get the last question. Hi. Uh, this is more of a passing comment, which may construct itself into a question. Um, as I was listening 
to your presentation, but also looking at the the many strands of research and how there's this sense where it's all there's connections, but it's also difficult to see the connections as well. The first thing I started to think of was like the sort of thinking process I have as an autistic person where I may have several ideas, but I can't, and they seem connected, but I can't connect them. Like, and there's times where I get frustrated and then there's times where I think of Keith's ne negative capability where I just have to basically go, just, that's just the way it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm trying to. No, I think that's very interesting, Richard. It's, it, I, I think, um, I think a lot of us suffer from various norms of how work should be done. Mm. And, um, uh, uh, and there's very much a, a kind of thing that I'm slowly late in life, maybe just in time to be properly Jungian individuated, but <laughs> maybe not. Uh, there's, uh, uh, which is, uh, uh, how to how to find a way of doing things that one is peaceful with that one has some that 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 that, that provides the the requisite trouble, but not to not not a trouble that that destroys you, provides the right kind of trouble, the right kind of challenge, the right kind of push, um, and uh, and I think I'm sort of groping my way towards an answer for that. Um, but this is this is this has occupied me for a large amount of my life. I've been an itinerant academic. I've not, you know, stayed in one particular discipline for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I've always been making a noise, though, in the background. Uh, but uh, and and I've always liked to follow issues where they seem to me to lead. Uh, but this doesn't always mean that the the work follows disciplinary boundaries or follows clear topics. Mm. And, and finding a way in which you can still work intuitively in that way uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and still and, and not lose oneself. Um, uh, that's, that to me is, a, is not lose oneself in a, in a bad sense of losing oneself. I think that's, mm -hmm. a, that's, a, that's very much a, something I'm, I'm wrestling with here. And it's, it's very interesting. I've, I've talked quite a lot of pe to a lot of people who have some kind of quote unquote diagnosis. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and, and some of the things you're saying re also resonate with people, for example, uh, who have a diagnosis of ADHD, who have a diagnosis of, um, of dyspraxia. Uh, mm. And uh, uh, and and you know I've 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 met specialists who have taken one look at my studio and go, do you have a clinical diagnosis of dyspraxia, or ADHD or autism? <laughs> right? And mm. and I, I, it really just trying to open out a a sort of more welcoming field I think for different methods is also a way of opening out a more welcoming field for different kinds of people. Mm a sort of inclusive inclusivity that's open to anybody who is receptive to the inclusivity, but also gives room for people to basically go, yeah, not my, I can't deal with this right now. So absolutely. Mm. One of the features of the way I mentioned that uh, in the case of the work um, that I did at FACT in Liverpool, with Tim mm -hmm. Shaw, uh, where we had uh, we did some public workshops. Now we designed this workshop, enabling people to have full autonomy over what they made. Um, uh, uh, it, it was not the kind of workshop which artists often curate, where everybody gets together and they do one thing, right? <laughs> and uh, you know, it was that everybody was equally responding to this sort of brief about alternative soundscaping for Liverpool in their different ways. And, uh, uh, and then we helped people, but on an entirely ad hoc and negotiated way. And we also did our own stuff. Mm. And, and what kept us was this, uh, the loose sense of belonging to the workshop. And there was not much more. We belonged to the workshop. 
uh, and then we ad hoc worked out what kind of relationships we wanted, um, uh, whether they were whether they were pedagogical relationships. Oh, you want to make that? This is how you do it. Or whether they were collaborative relationships, mm -hmm. or whether people just got on with stuff individually uh, for whatever reason. And again, that is something I'm very keen on. Again, that there could be multiple configurations of how people work within a just a general sort of uh, uh, ambit of ambit of belonging. Um, yeah. Great. Thank, thank you. Yes. Thanks, Richard, for the question. Thank you, John. Um, there's some other nice comments here on the chat. John, you can check out. There's a um, most recent there from Simon Waters. But uh, thank you all for attending. I uh, hope you hope to see, um, or well, I probably won't see you, but hopefully you attend our concert tomorrow. Yeah, you can unmute your microphone if you want and join me in, in thanking John. For Thanks. His... Yep, so thank you very much, John. Thanks, John. Thank you. See you tomorrow. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>